Janet Moxley, a uh, member of the Green Party, and very involved with the Green Yes campaign, and I've been invited to chair this this evening. So it's great to see good turnout. Um, it's a big hall, and it's great to see so many people in it. Um, we've already asked you to move down to the front. Housekeeping wise, as far as I know, there are no fire alarms or anything this evening. It is a fire alarm, there are fire exits on either sides of the room. Um, so that's the admin bit. Um, the um, purpose of the evening really is, is to hear some views on the radical independence agenda from our three speakers, Dan Foley, Sarah Collins, and Willie McDonald. Dan is chair of radical independence, Don Fries and Galloway. Um, he's also been involved with Generation Yes, with the uh, Yes vote for the young and women people, like that he is. Um, he's a tra you know, trade unionist, a former student activist, and he stays in Don Fries. Um, Sarah was until last week the chair of um, the Youth Committee of Scottish TUC. Uh, she's a branch secretary of a trade union in East Ayrshire uh, and is a radical independence and trade union activist for YES. And Willie is originally from Oban, moved to Dumfries in 2009. Um, he's a member of Labour Voters for Independence. Um, he's um, worked in the NHS since 2010, initially as a nursing assistant and now works in equipment services. While in Open, he worked in care services for six years, working for folk with dementia, and he's married and has got three stepchildren. Um, so, um, so, without further ado, we'll pass on to our speakers. So, Dan, first. Yeah. Right. So, just well, the format of the we'll have the speakers, we'll have a short comfort break, and then we'll have a video, and then come back for questions and answers at the end. Um, there should be some um, bits of paper at the back if anyone has any questions that they want to write down and pass them, um, to, to read out or you can stick your hand up and ask, ask your questions if you want to do that um, in the Q&As after we've had the speaker's video and um, come back for that.
The media coverage focuses on the supposed risks of independence, but completely ignores the risks of staying in the UK. Don't be fooled, there is already huge pressure on the Barnet formula, the system by which Scotland's funding from Westminster is decided, a trade-off for them taking our oil money. If we reject independence, it will be adjusted and we will be worse off by at least £4 billion a year. This will put the ideals we cherish under threat. The NHS will be under threat of creeping privatisation, as it already is in England and Wales. Free tuition fees will also be under threat. There is no doubt that the NHS and our education system will be much more secure in an independent Scotland where we can decide where to spend our money. Another threat of staying in the Union. 75% of George Osborne's cuts are still to take place. And we know that the burden for austerity is falling upon the poor, and it will continue to do so. Fair enough, you may say. I'll just vote Labour at the next election. Well, that might be okay if they hadn't already committed themselves to sticking to the coalition, coalition's austerity plans. To coin a phrase that the no side are so fond of currently, Labour are Westminster's plan B for the next general election. This is not a party that is going to work in the interests of ordinary Scottish people. It's already commit committed to further attacks on the poor, such as axing job seekers allowance for under 23s, and has allowed policies such as the bedroom tax to be approved by Parliament. And let's not forget, Labour are the best hope we have in Westminster. The polling suggests that a Conservative administration, possibly in coalition with UKIP, is the very, un very likely outcome of the next UK general election. The situation at Westminster always reminds me of my granny. My first memories all take place during the John Major era. I can remember my granny saying, just you wait son, it'll all be fine when Labour gets back in. Then, in 1997, they did get back in, and she and, mil she and millions of other working class people were let down. So then she would just say, just you wait until they get rid of that Tony Blair son and Gordon Brown's in charge. Then it will all be okay. Well, I'm sure I don't need to tell you how that worked out. Sadly, she's passed away now. But despite the fact that she, like myself, was no nationalist and no fan of Alex Salmond or the SNP, I think she'd be here tonight campaigning for a yes vote because she'd recognise that it is our best hope of moving away from the neoliberal agenda of the Westminster elite. I urge you all to reject the Westminster system that punishes the poor whilst lining the pockets of bankers and MPs. The only way we can escape this system is a radical change, and that radical change is independence. Thank you. Scotland deserves 
and expect a party that represents these values. Now, currently, all Scottish Labour politicians, from councillors to MPs and MSPs, must toe the party line. But this is a party line that is set by the high regions in London. And first and foremost come the needs and the wants of the South East and the City of London. We in LFI believe that in an independent Scotland, your elected representatives will have to be focused on what is best for Scotland and for our people. I believe that the political system in this country is failing Scotland. We take, for example, the bedroom tax. Now, this is a legislation that was introduced to tackle the high costs of private rents, primarily in London and the southeast of England. And yet, when the Tories came to power, they took this legislation and they extended it to, to take in social housing. They didn't take into account the fact there's a dire shortage of one bedroom homes, or that many of those affected are disabled people who need an additional room for carers or even, or even for equipment. And that's before we mention the complete disregard for community. People want to stay in their local communities with the family ties and social support. And on September the 18th, we are not being asked to vote on a form of government. What we are asked to vote, sorry, what we're being asked to vote on is the right to choose a government that represents our needs and our wants. <coughs> Excuse me. What we have a chance is to get to build is a Scotland that puts all of us first and doesn't just pander to the needs and the wants of the biggest, the richest, and the most powerful. A society when those that are in real need are cared for and not demonised. A society in which those in work are able to support themselves and their families without having to rely on tax credits or even food banks. A society which rather than waste weapon, money on weapons of mass murder invests in its people. And a society in which our health service is not being broken up and sold to the highest bidder. I would like to see a brighter, fairer and more just future for Scotland. And as we mentioned, we have what it takes to become a successful independent country. All the political leaders who are currently campaigning against Scottish independence, apart from Alistair Darwin, is willing to admit that Scotland has what it takes. But they don't think we should. They say that we're better together. They say that the UK is OK. But you ask yourself, is OK good enough for you? We live in a, con a country which, according to the OECD, is rated as the fourth most unequal in the developed world. And to me, that's not OK. Before the 18th of September, I'd like you to ask yourself these questions. Where do you want to place your hope? Holyrood or Westminster? Who do you think has the courage to stand up for Scotland? Holyrood or Westminster? Who do you think will provide justice for the people of Scotland? Holyrood or Westminster? And who do you feel has the integrity to manage Scotland the way it should be? Thank you.
We struggle every single day for our two junior members, for our families, for our friends, to get a better deal for them. And we're constantly fighting for those things. And the question for us in September then is not, well, let's put our cross next to yes in September the 18th and hope that it's all okay. And we'll wake up the next morning and suddenly there'll be some sort of socialist utopia or on Independence Day, you know, there'll be manna and honey, etc. Essentially the question for us instead is a strategic question. It's well put in a cross in the box next to yes in September the 18th offer us the opportunity to have a better society. Will basically voting yes strengthen our position to strive for a fairer and more equal society? And before answering that question, I think I'd like to address three of the main points that Bear Together campaign are constantly making. And that's that we're too wee, too poor, and too daft to be independent. Well, the first one is quite easy to answer, actually. Are we too small to be independent? Of the 14, most rich, 14 richest countries in the world, more than half of them have the same population as Scotland, there or thereabouts. So the second question is, well, if they're the same population as Scotland, why are these countries richer than Scotland? Especially when a lot of them don't have the same sort of natural resources. So there's been decades of a Westminster neoliberal consensus that's driven down Scotland into the ground. There's no industrial strategy coming from Westminster. There's only privatisation and outsourcing. And we know that that's set to continue no matter what party is in power. We know that the Virgin Healthcare is now the second biggest provider of healthcare next to the NHS in England. And that's something that will be coming to Scotland if there's a no hope. The UK can't survive a financial sector-led recovery. We need an industrial strategy in order to actually get out of recession, get out of the doldrums. But in order to do that, there needs to be the political will to make sure that that happens. And we have to look at what sort of an industrial strategy is we're talking about. If we're talking about natural resources, then maybe you're talking about the oil. And we have to be saying that we need a Norwegian-style sovereign oil fund so that we can actually take the money from the companies, stop them making massive profits, and put it back into the public sector put it into the renewable energies, put it back into the manufacturing and industries in Scotland and get Scotland working again in the sense that people are actually paid a living wage for a sustainable, good job that actually benefits the whole society and the whole country. We've already heard as well that the, the UK is the fourth most unequal society in the Western world. It's also, of course, one of the richest. So the problem with Britain, the UK is not okay, but the problem is wealth redistribution and why the wealth is centred in the city of London. And we obviously all know that that's not an accident. It's done by the British establishment for a reason, because it's all friends in the city of London and they're lying in each other's pockets. So the third question is, well, are we too daft to pull it off? Can we actually pull off being an independent nation that is different from the way things have been done previously? And the answer to this is, no, we're not too daft to do this. The key thing is grassroots empowerment of people. All of these things that we talk about are sort of wish list of a better society. They all depend on political will and people having the strength and confidence to actually take these things forward. None of the political parties in the current system are going to be doing that for us. It depends on every single person here, every single person around the country who's at these meetings to go out and try and demand that, to go out and take that for themselves. And this referendum campaign has shown us that there is real grassroots empowerment in Scotland taking place right now. I was at a meeting last night with Jim Sellers, and Jim Sellers, who obviously has been a politician for decades across Britain, said that this campaign is the biggest movement of people and actually talking about social justice across the whole of Scotland that he's ever seen. Campaigning for one issue, but campaigning from a perspective of making sure that those who can do for those who can't in the future. And what we've seen is that people who were previously disenfranchised by the system are coming forward to actually take up the mantle of going forward to strive for a better society. It's women who are at the forefront of this movement. It's young people at the forefront of this movement. It's people who have never been registered to vote before. They now think that there is actually something that they're worth voting for. So that takes me back to the original question. Will a yes vote strengthen our position for a better society? And I think you've heard quite a lot of the same sort of buzzwords coming from us tonight, you know, neoliberalism, the Westminster consensus, all that kind of thing. 
But that goes to show where this level of debate is at. It's not a debate about Scotland versus England and Scottish people are much better than English people or any of that sort of nationalist stuff. This is essentially a debate about democracy and about social justice. And that's why all over the country, these debates are happening and the same sort of arguments are coming out, the same debates are coming out. Now, independence, of course, is a risk. It's an economic risk and it's a political risk. And there is uncertainty in it. But there's also uncertainty in staying in the UK. People don't think about that in their daily lives when they're not being faced with this big question of yes or no. There's uncertainty about remaining in the UK as to whether or not we'll be in the EU in the future, as to whether or not there's going to be a Tory UK government next year, as to whether or not there's going to be any sort of recovery, real recovery in real terms for the United Kingdom. But one thing is certain if we do remain in the UK, and that's that no matter what parties in Westminster, we are going to be governed by careerist MPs, the House of Lords and the City of London, because there's no political will to change that. That is the British establishment, and that's exactly what we're up against right now. There's a reason that they want to remain together. It's an absolute international embarrassment to the British state if we vote yes in September. And think about all the people around the world who have been harmed by the British state in some way. They are going to be crying out for us to vote yes. None more so than people actually in England, Wales, Ireland. When I speak to trade union, um, other trade unionists in the rest of the UK, they're crying out for us to vote yes, to show that there is an alternative, to show that Maggie Thatcher was wrong when she says there is no alternative, to show that this is not the end of history and that actually we can go forward, create a better society in the same sort of conditions as the rest of the United Kingdom and be a catalyst for people. This referendum is about thousands of people who have been disempowered and disenfranchised across the generations. And now people are waking up, they've got confidence to come out to these meetings, they've got confidence to come and speak, to go knocking doors, to go into street stalls that they've never had before. That kind of confidence is still going to be there on the 19th of September. If we wake up with a yes vote, people are not going to just leave it up to the current politicians, to all the sort of pale stale male suits who normally talk about politics. People are going to be confident that they went out, they campaigned, and that they won. And they're going to take that forward. And that's the sort of inspiring message that I think we have to take from this campaign. We obviously are very, very close in the vote right now. Um, there's, depending on what polls you, you look at, sort of 10, 10, 15 percent. If everybody in this room who's voting yes already goes out to convince an undecided or no voter, if even 25 percent of the whole of the people in Scotland who are already voting yes, convince and undecided or no. This is something that's very, very winnable. We've got about five weeks to do this, and it's down to every single person in this room and across the country who's voting yes to make sure that we actually get it.